Hello Super K Teens and welcome to another episode of Telescuela TV. This is a special episode because this is the last physical science episode for this quarter. I hope that you were able to learn a lot from our previous episodes. It has not been easy learning through the distance learning modality, but here you are, a day away from Christmas break and a quarter away from finishing the first semester. You deserve a pat on the back. In this episode, we will learn about the last two most essential learning competencies, which are active ingredients of cleaning products used at home and use of the other ingredients in cleaning agents. This is a topic I'm sure you can all relate to because you help clean your house every day, or do you? Well, whether or not you help clean the house, I'm sure you are exposed to many of the chemicals we will talk about this afternoon, especially when you use soap and shampoo when you clean your body. Because of the current pandemic that we are facing, a lot of us are stuck in our houses. Teachers like me no longer have to go to school every day. Students who are older than 15 are only allowed to go outside to do things that are essential. The ones that are younger are stuck at home. It is therefore very important that we maintain the cleanliness of our house and our body to avoid diseases and to avoid the virus. And equally important for me is that we have to know what's inside the cleaning agents that we are using because we have to make sure that they really help instead of making things worse. Active ingredients are found in different household cleaning products. These active ingredients and other ingredients make a cleaning agent effective for cleaning but these cleaning materials can also give side effects to us humans. As consumers and users, we need to learn what chemicals are inside these cleaning products and we need to know how they can affect us and the environment. Before we start, I would just like to emphasize that when we talk of chemicals or ingredients in a certain product, we must consider the change that has already occurred because of chemical reaction. Let me give you an example. If you look at the product label of any soap, you will see that one of the ingredients of soap is sodium hydroxide or caustic soda or lye. One Google search about it and you will discover that this is an irritant. Sodium hydroxide is a very dangerous chemical. It can burn your eyes and your skin, and if you accidentally swallow high concentrations of it, it could also burn your digestive system and your lungs, which may lead to permanent damage or death. That's how dangerous it is. Then why is it in our soap? And if it is that dangerous, then why doesn't soap burn our skin? Like what I said earlier, we have to consider the chemical reaction that has already occurred when the ingredients were mixed. To make the most basic soap, all you have to do is to mix sodium hydroxide and oil. The sodium hydroxide or lye will react with oil and then the oil will be converted into soap. When that happens, you neither have the oil nor the sodium hydroxide. You only have the soap. For those who want to try this at home, I know that it is easy to buy sodium hydroxide online, but you really have to handle it carefully. Wear gloves, lab coat, face mask, and goggles to protect yourself. Knowing that you have to mix sodium hydroxide with oil is also not enough. The amount of sodium hydroxide and oil that you will put in will depend on the type of oil that you will use. There are a lot of lie calculators online that you can use to help you with that. So good luck! Two years ago, I bought sodium hydroxide oil and essential oils for fragrance and we made soap in the classroom. Though we were successful in making soap, it was very apparent that the soap we made looked very different from the soap that we can buy from the store. The texture and the smell were different. I told my students that it is because the soaps that we made were very basic. To make soaps look more appealing to the consumers, the manufacturers put additional ingredients to make them smell better, achieve a better texture and color, and make them last longer. We will learn about some of them in this episode. Let's take a look at the back of a bar soap and see what ingredients we can find. We will first see the different types of oils 
that were used to make the soap and also the sodium hydroxide it was mixed with. We can also see that perfume was added. I'd like to turn your attention to this ingredient, titanium dioxide. Titanium dioxide is an odorless white powder that is used as a dye or pigment. In simple terms, we put this in soap to color it white or to lighten other colors. It is also used in paints, paper, cosmetics, toothpaste, and medicine. Titanium dioxide is a suspected cancer hazard if inhaled. This means that it has a tendency to cause cancer if you inhale the powder at high concentrations. This is another thing that I want you to remember when we are talking about the chemicals in the products that we are using. When you read something online that tells you that a certain chemical is harmful, you have to exert an extra effort to read and research further. Find out if the chemical is harmful in all forms or in just a few ones. Find out if it is only toxic at high concentrations or if it is also toxic even at very low concentrations. Since titanium dioxide in soap is not in powder form and that you cannot inhale high concentrations of it from soap, it is considered a safe pigment. Let's take a look at other ingredients. Next one on the list is tetrasodium EDTA. One of the advantages that this soap has over our soap is that it has tetrasodium EDTA or ethylene diamine tetraacetic acid. This chemical helps increase the shelf life of soap. The soap that we made will expire faster than the soap we buy from the store. When making soap, sometimes soap makers encounter a problem called dreaded orange spots or DOS. This happens when there are a lot of metal ions like calcium and magnesium in the water used to make soap. To solve this problem, many soap makers use tetrasodium EDTA because it binds up certain metals that can cause DOS or dreaded orange spots. Instead of EDTA, other soap makers also use sodium gluconate and they do the same thing. They combine with metal ions on the water and then they take them out of the solution. Now let's take a look at what's inside our shampoos. First on our list are water and sodium laureth sulfate. Water is of course not an active ingredient so we'll give more attention to sodium laureth sulfate. Sodium laureth sulfate is a surfactant. Surfactants are compounds that lower the surface tension between two liquids, between a gas and a liquid, or between a liquid and a solid. Surfactants are commonly amphiphilic. This means that they commonly contain both a hydrophobic tail and a hydrophilic head. Simply put, its tail is oil-soluble and its head is water-soluble. If your head is full of oil from eating lechon using your hand, it will be very hard to clean it by just rinsing it with water. You learned from the previous Telescuela episode about polarity of molecules that polar substances dissolve in polar solvents and nonpolar substances dissolve in nonpolar solvents. Since water is polar, it does not dissolve or mix with oil, which is a nonpolar substance. This is where the importance of surfactants come in. Surfactants have heads that will mix with water and they have tails that will mix with oil. The tails of the surfactant will attach to the oil and the head will attach to the water, making it easy to rinse the oil. This is the reason why your hair feels less oily after washing it with shampoo. Well, aside from shampoos, sodium laureth sulfate can also be found in other personal care products like body wash, face wash, and even in toothpaste. Next on our list is dimethicanol. Dimethicanol is commonly used in conditioners, shampoos, cosmetic creams, lotions, suntan products, bath soaps, and lipsticks. When used in shampoos, it helps the hair look and feel glossy and silky. What it does is that it seals and protects the hair. It creates a barrier around the hair strand to keep the moisture in. Next is coca midopropyl betaine or CAPB. This substance is another example of a surfactant and can also be found in body washes, conditioners, toothpaste, and shaving creams. The question here is why do we have to use more than one surfactant in a shampoo? Shampoo formulations need both primary and secondary surfactants. 
The one that has the highest concentrations in the product is the primary surfactant. It provides the most fundamental effect on the hair. The role of the secondary surfactant then is to boost the effects of the primary surfactant. There are secondary surfactants that boost the foaming effects of the primary surfactant. Though not generally related to its effectiveness, most consumers are attracted to buying a shampoo that creates more bubbles and foams. And you know that this is true. When a cleaning agent does not create bubbles, you feel that it is not working or that it is not effective. Well, scientifically speaking, bubbles don't affect the capacity of the product to clean. But because consumers prefer those that make lots of foam, shampoo formulations are commonly made so that they will bubble a lot. There are also secondary surfactants that make the shampoo milder to the scalp and eyes. This is especially useful in making shampoo for kids that are no tears. So far, we've learned about many of the ingredients found in the common cleaning agents in our house. We've learned that soaps contain perfume to make them smell good, dyes to make them look good, and chelating agents to avoid dreaded orange spots, and to make it last longer. We've also learned that cleaning agents contain surfactants that effectively remove and rinse oil and dirt. Lastly, we've learned that shampoos have substances like dimethicanol that make hair look glossy and silky. We will have a short commercial break. Don't go away. We will come back to discuss more active ingredients and other ingredients only here at Telescuela TV. Welcome back to Super K Telescuela. Now let's continue looking at the active and other ingredients of shampoo. Aside from bubbles, what consumers are looking for in a product is the smell. That's why perfume is one of the major ingredients of shampoo. This shampoo has sodium chloride too. Sodium chloride is known as the table salt. The primary function of sodium chloride in shampoo is as a thickening agent or as a thickener. Thickeners give cleaning agents the proper viscosity or thickness. It makes sure that it can still flow out of a bottle or sachet. It is generally considered safe for the skin, but since sodium chloride or salt draws out moisture, it can make an already sensitive scalp dry and itchy. Carbomer is another thickener found in shampoo. Aside from helping control the viscosity and flow of cosmetic products, Carbomers also help distribute and suspend insoluble solids into liquid and prevent the oil and liquid parts of the shampoo from separating. You know when you leave a peanut butter to stand for a long time? The oil separates from the mixture which makes it oily on top and dry at the bottom. That's what the carbomer is trying to avoid. Carbomer can also be found in styling gel, facial moisturizers, sunscreen, eye cream, cleansers, and scrubs. Another one on the list is biotin. Biotin is believed to prevent hair loss. Now let's put our attention to sodium benzoate. Sodium benzoate functions as a preservative in shampoo. It is generally safe. In fact, it can also be found in food, but of course, it is harmful in excessive amount. If you look further down on the ingredient list, you will see phenoxyethanol and iodopropanyl butyl carbamate or IPBC. Both of these compounds are preservatives just like sodium benzoate. The preservative iodopropanyl butyl carbamate or IPBC helps prevent molds, bacteria, and other germs from spreading. It can also be found in foundations, concealers, makeup, conditioner, body washes, lip balm, and moisturizers. We have to note that the presence of water in any product makes the product vulnerable for bacterial and fungal growth. That is why they need preservatives to prevent the growth of bacteria, yeast, and molds. No one wants bacteria in their cleaning agents. All preservatives have a certain level of toxic effects on living organisms, otherwise they would not be effective preservatives. 
In using cleaning products, we really have to make a compromise. Most of these preservatives are relatively safe to be used in small amounts. And products like shampoos have an acceptable concentrations of these in their formulation. But these preservatives can also be found in other cleaning agents. The more you use, the more you are exposed to these compounds. Shampoos also use weak acids like citric acid as some sort of preservative because it prevents bacterial growth. Another reason why manufacturers put citric acid in shampoo is to adjust its pH. Shampoos are usually slightly acidic because when it is so, the scales on the hair follicles lay flat which makes the hair feel smooth and shiny. Citric acid then functions as a pH adjuster. Let's take a look at the list of ingredients again. This shampoo has titanium dioxide. Do you still remember what titanium dioxide is? It is the white odorless powder used as a white pigment. It is a common colorant used in cleaning agents. Aside from titanium dioxide, mica is also used as a dye or colorant. Another familiar ingredient is sodium hydroxide. We learned earlier that it is one of the major ingredients of soap. We mix it with oil to make soap. In shampoos, manufacturers put a small amount of sodium hydroxide to the product to reduce the acidity of the shampoo, to avoid hair damage, and to relax and straighten the hair. That is why manufacturers who want to make a shampoo that straightens and relaxes hair add sodium hydroxide in much higher concentrations. Concentrated solutions of sodium hydroxide can be harmful and can cause chemical burn on the scalp. So far, we have learned the active and other ingredients found in soap and shampoos. We will now discuss the ingredients found in other cleaning agents like bleach and detergent. Let's start with bleach. The active ingredient in bleach is sodium hypochlorite. It is the oldest and still most important chlorine-based bleach. Though bleach is readily available and can be bought even in sari-sari stores in your barangay, it doesn't mean that it is safe and risk-free. Sodium hypochlorite is very corrosive. This means that it can cause severe skin burns and eye damage. It becomes even more dangerous when we mix it with other cleaning products such as acids and ammonia because it will produce toxic fumes. Sodium hypochlorite is very useful because aside from being able to bleach, it can also remove stain and deodorize. It can also effectively disinfect or kill bacteria, fungi, and viruses on various surfaces. Using it is actually one of the cheapest ways we can disinfect a room in this time of pandemic. Now let's talk about detergents. Powder detergents also contain bleaching agents. One of the simplest and most common bleaching agents in detergents is hydrogen peroxide. Hydrogen peroxide is a colorless liquid at room temperature with bitter taste. Please do not ever try to taste it. It is very dangerous. It can damage your eyes, your skin, and respiratory system. It is a disinfectant, antibacterial, and antiviral agent. Another bleaching agent is zinc thalocyanine sulfonate or ZPS. Detergents also have builders that make surfactants more powerful. An example of this is disodium silicate. Builders are basically water softeners. Water is considered as hard water when it has lots of metal ions in it. Builders bind with these magnesium and calcium ions. Because of this, the availability of these metal ions is removed from the wash water solution. The problem with metal ions in the water is that they react with the other ingredients in the detergent and make them less effective. That's why manufacturers put builders in the formulation. The builders will bind with these ions so that they cannot react with the surfactants in the detergent. Aside from softening the water, builders can also provide a desirable level of alkalinity that improves cleaning performance. Another builder that is used is STPP or sodium tripolyphosphate. 
It has high binding capacity for heavy metals and calcium ion, which means that it's good. However, it has a potential effect to eutrophication, and eutrophication happens when the water is over rich in nutrients that leads to the excessive growth of algae. Now it is time for us to review what we have learned so far. Even without advanced knowledge in chemistry, we all know that it is very difficult to clean oil and dirt by just using water. We need surfactants that will bind with these oil and water at the same time so they can be washed away by water. To increase the efficiency of these cleaning agents and to make them more appealing to the consumers, manufacturers have added additional ingredients to them. These are number one builders. Builders help the surfactants by binding with the metal ions in the water so that the surfactants can focus on cleaning and not deal with the ion metals anymore. Number two is fragrances. These are a group of ingredients that give the cleaning product a pleasant smell. Not all products have fragrances, but a lot of them have because many consumers are more attracted to a cleaning agent that has a very fragrant smell. Number three is preservatives. Just as it is important to prevent food from spoiling, cleaning products need to be preserved as well. We add preservatives in cleaning agents to make them stable and last longer. Number four is pH adjusters. Every cleaning product needs to be balanced to work well and to be safe for our skin. Adjusting the pH can also help to keep the product from working well as it gets old. Lastly, adjusting the pH can help improve the efficiency of the cleaner. For example, each surfactant has a different pH level at which they are more powerful. Number five is dye. The color of the product is something some consumers consider before buying. Manufacturers can control the final color of the cleaning agents by adding dyes or pigments or colorants. Number six, thickener. This gives the soap the proper viscosity or thickness to make sure that it still can flow out of the container. And last but not the least, foam enhancers. Foam enhancers help create foams or bubbles. While it is not necessary for effective cleaning, many people feel the bubbles are the reason why their products are working. Congratulations! You have now reached the end of the final episode of Telescuela TV for this quarter. Next quarter, we will talk about astronomy, laws of motion, light, and other physics topics. We will be back next year with more fun and more engaging videos only here at Telescuela TV. Goodbye and have a great Christmas break!